Thank you, Tim and Katarina, for inviting me to speak. I think it's very fun to be part of the introductory course. And uh, I, will tell I will talk today about um, qualities of relational aesthetics and spatial praxis between art and architecture for transforming the discipline of architecture and urban design. Uh, my presentation focuses on an actual particip participative planning process in central Berlin by the example of Tempelhofer Freiheit, or which would be, uh, the translation would be Tempelhof Freedom, a former airfield in the process of becoming a park, which you see here in the, in the picture. So I will consider the topic alteration from the viewpoint of the culture of architectural praxis. My thesis is that the context for planning and making architecture has changed through a shift of relationship between the experts on one side and the users on the other. This boundary gets more and more blurred as citizens are more and more ready to take initiatives themselves. Communities and users demand better information, more transparency and involvement in decisions concerning the transformation of their cities. This both in political and spatial terms, as in the example of Stuttgart 21, a mega train station project in Germany, as well as in respect to spatial design decisions, as an example of Slussen in Stockholm. To give you a brief insight. In Stuttgart, the city plans to demolish its terminus train station and to move the station underground. The main goal was, with this move, to free new sites in the city centre with high land value, among other objectives, of course, to develop them. These plots were sold out uh, to investors in a very early stage of the plan not calculating the broad civic protest these projects, this project would spark when the plan became public. It showed remarkable effects. The citizens' rage through all ages and political orientation brought the conservative government of the county to downfall, and the protest movement engaged its own specialists in the debate who were publicly perceived as better informed, more capable and more trustworthy than the experts of the government, the planning team and the client, the German train company. There's a broad agreement since then in Germany going through all parties that this example of planning is a catastrophe and must never happen again. To avoid this in the future, commu communities sh uh, would, have be to would have to be involved in spatial and environmental decisions from the start. In Stockholm, we have an interesting case with the planned alteration of Slussen. At the last competition, there ex since the last after the last competition, there exists a planning a winning proposal by Foster and Partners, in co collaboration with the Stockholm firm by Architect Contour. And you see in this picture, um, it depicts this winning proposal. However, politicians, city planners, and the public are confronted with numerous self-initiated alternative design proposals made visible in the press in seminars and in exhibitions. And this shows that citizens have a strong desire to involve themselves in developing sites with a high symbol symbolic value on a peer level with experts. So this is the point of departure for my presentation. Uh, let's look at architectural praxis now. If architecture, urban planning and design truly intended to turn towards more just futures, they would have to rethink fundamentally their roles in relation to society, their value systems, their material cultures, social structures and institu 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 institutionalizing practices of their discipline. A search for purely technical solutions simply added to the status quo without questioning professional protocols and identities would not be enough. A real change required more utopian approaches than it that envisioned structural changes and altering practices that bring them about. Altering practice is a term coined by the architect Doina Petrescu, a member of Atelier d'Architecture Autogéré, and uh, she describes it as undermining, subverting received identities and authoritative rules, norms and tools, and working out other shared meanings th 
throughout the transformation. It could also be an appeal to yearning. As Bell Hooks has put it, the question of yearning is not who we are, but who we want to become. The ordering practices are about what, what we want the world to become. This means that an ordering practice takes a critical view on normative values and standard procedures in order to propose alternatives. This goes far beyond an understanding of architecture as only concerned with the production of building. It means bringing a discussion about architecture's social and societal role back into the discourse of architecture. For thinking architecture as a critical spatial praxis, we would need a theory or aesthetics of relations as we have this in art. Theories for relational aesthetics have been formulated in, in an art context already in the 1990s by Nicolas Bourriot in 1950-95. Other terms um, discussed are um, context art, or new genre public art or connective aesthetics by other theorists. And here they claim that, or you can say in art, um, in contrast to architecture, you have a very early interest in participatory and collaborative praxis, where the activity itself constitutes the artwork rather than an object that may evolve as the result of the time spent together. That is, the diff that is different to architecture theory, where the realm of relationships has not yet been theorized and where the arrival at, at the object is still seen as the main aim. So this is the main difference. Um, um, the turn towards processes and relations in art, I think, in the fetish of the object in architecture, which is all the more surprising because relational architecture practices emerged during the 1990s as well. An example would be the interdisciplinary architecture practice MAF in London. Tellingly, the catalog does not refer to works or projects, but is specified as a manual containing a call for action and DIY. Another example, uh, architectural practices that evolved during the 90s recession in Germany were later referred to as off architecture by the architecture magazine Arch Plus, Arch Plus publishing two numbers on this topic in 2003. For them, off architecture described a new kind of architecture scene where the office becomes exhibition space, bar, platform for discussions and exchange outside of institutionalized structures with the potential for sparking a new discourse. The so-called off architects who worked in network cultures started to form a critical mass and entered publicity, according to them. So they do not respond to briefs anymore, they formulate their own agenda. The most prominent German example is probably Raumlabor, which you see um, the cover of their book on the right side. They have been invited to Stockholm so many times that they're probably not, you probably cannot call them as a practice out existing outside institu institutionalized pr structures. But that is fine, I think. So back to relational aesthetics. In contrast to architecture and planning, artworks that involve the public have received substantial, substantial attention since the French art theorist, curator and former director of Palais de Tokyo in Paris, Nicolas Bourriot coined the term relational aesthetics in his book with the same title. In the exhibition catalogue, wait a minute, with his book in the same title, but there was a year before he published an exhibition catalogue uh, called Traffic in 1995. He refers to relational aesthetics as an art that takes as its horizon the sphere of human interactions and its social context rather than the assertion of an autonomous and private symbolic space. He connects the emergence of these new aesthetic forms to the birth of global urban culture and the extension of the urban model to almost all cultural phenomena. Artworks consist in the cooking of a dinner in the gallery space, like in the work of Rikri Tiravanija, in the running of cafes and bars for art in events, as in the Café for Venice Biennial by Tobias Rehberger, maybe some of you have seen that last year, uh, but also in much more intricate encounters between artists and publics that are made visible in some forms of documentation, as in the work of Sophie Kall, which you see here. 
She followed passers-by, and in this work, The Shadow, she is followed herself by a private detective. Boyo stresses that this is not really about expanding the term of art as in the 1960s anymore, but that, that this is really about looking at relations and building intentional and unintentional communities. Now it can be claimed that art and architecture have always been relation to some extent. They have, in other words, always been, they have, in other words, always been a factor in sociability. They have always been the basis for dialogue and sites that produce sociability. But Boyo points beyond this private experience to the larger picture and what it means in the context of societal change. The question that he asked for art, and I suggest to reframe it to architecture, is rather how can architecture that is centered on the production of such modes of conviviality succeed in relaunching the modern project of emancipation as we contemplate it? How does it allow us to define new cultural and political goals? And uh, with the modern project, he refers to an ethical approach, but also to aesthetic experience and uh, adventurous thinking. So first he suggests, uh, so he suggests taking a look at where relational art architecture works were located within the overall governing system of the economy, symbolic or material. He and other scholars have referred to the relational work as a social interstice, borrowing a term by Karl Marx, which is produced outside of capitalist market forces. They see the art architecture work as a possible new model for reality a testing ground for alternative economies in relation to a production without consumers and consumer ob objects for exchange, but before all a testing ground for alternative economies where production is a collective process with participants or collaborators. An interest is, is a space in social relations, which although it fits more or less harmoniously and openly into the overall all system, suggests possibilities for exchange other than that prevail, that those that prevail the system. Dona Potrescu speaks of an economy of desire, which also points to a process that is driven by the participants rather than by authorities or by the market, and where the notion of interaction, community and agency plays a crucial role. Her pre project Ecobox in Paris, which you see here, is an example for the changing of the parameters for the use of public space through the establishing of a structure of productive neighborhood gardens. A further point Bourio makes is that relational aesthetics raise awareness of our relationships with authority. Art looks into its own constructedness, a perspective that architecture has rarely considered. However, he suggests we should ask ourselves in front of an art piece, art architecture piece, does the work allow me to exist or does it deny my existence as a subject and does its structure, does its structure refuse to consider the other? Does space-time suggested or described by this work, together with the laws that govern it, correspond to my real-life aspirations? Relational aesthetics negotiate open relations that are not pre-established. The status of the viewer in art or user in architecture alternates between that of a passive con consumer and that of a witness, an associate, a client, a guest, a co-producer, a neighbor and a protagonist. But it changes not only the role of the participant or collaborator, but also that of the architect. Bourriot points here to Marx's critique of the classical distinction between praxis, the act of self-transformation, and poesis, an action designed to produce or transform matter. On the contrary, he claims, through relational processes, praxis becomes constantly part of poesis and vice versa. So these practices of contemporary artists, architects, create structures that include working methods and ways of life, rather than the concrete object that once defined the field of art architecture. They use time as a raw material. Form takes priority over things and flows over categories. The production of gestures is more important than the production of material things. My very short architectural case study in this presentation is the actual participative planning process in Berlin by the example of Tempelhofer Freiheit, um, a former airfield in the center. Most of it will be turned into a park. For pursuing this change, 
The Berlin Senate for City Development has announced a program for citizen involvement. It includes several different approaches to participation and the plan is to show this process and its result in an international building exhibition in 2020. This is a truly unusual project with great transformative potential for at least two reasons. Concerning the hugeness of the area and second, the process of planning for it. Rarely does it happen that such a large empty space of 368 hectares in the middle of a city can be freed for a different future. 250 hectares will not be built on but instead turned into parkland. The area re represents an enormous resource as urban green and public space for recreational, cultural and social activities but also as a mental space for letting new urban ideas and activities evolve, formerly unthinkable to have in a city centre. So this is, um, this is a proposal that came, that came from, from people who have handed that in on, a, on an open uh, internet process dialogue. There was an open process where everybody could in hand, hand in proposals and they ranged from a mountain here to a lake or the suggestion to give each Berliner one square meter to decide whatever to do with it whatever they wanted. Unusual for Berlin and Germany is also the invitation is the invitation of citizens to partic participate in the planning process, but it's urgently demanded as the latest protests have shown. So since 2010 the former airfield has already opened its gates to the public during daytime hours, giving space to le leisure and social activities such as biking, jogging, skating, cross-country skiing in winter, but also community gardening, barbecuing and hanging out. With a mi minimum design of design interventions, the large field is basically only programmed at this point, made may it visible through sign posts like that barbecue sign here. Um, which des which um, points to humans, but it also points to animals. You find um, plates that um, that uh, explain that there is there is a bir bird nesting area. You, you see this here on the left in the background. There is a there is a sign, so you ca you are not allowed to enter, or there is just pure information about what animals uh, exist on the field, in the on the ground, in the in the air, and so on. Um, other demarcations uh, on the ground um, indicating indicate new possibilities um, how to use these former runways. So when you enter, you will, inf will find information points and other infrastructures such as bathrooms and here's also the possibility to buy soft drinks and snacks. Otherwise, there's no commercial use going on in the park. The use of this field is monitored as part of the participation process and when you leave this field... Oh, Sorry about that. <coughs> and uh, when you leave this field, it can happen that a friendly young man, like the man to the right, approaches you and asks you how much time you have spent, how, what you did, and um, what you have seen, and so on. So in general, the space is greatly appreciated, has extremely many visitors, um, inhabitants, neighbors, and uh, tourists. Already since 2007, various steps for initiating and managing a collaborative planning process have been on their way, from an internet dialogue with 900, first 900 and then Later, 400 proposals and thousands of commentaries, citizen polls, focus groups and open group dialogues to the proposal of so-called pioneer fields, which you see here one, uh, where in the future a uh, more temporary self-generated project, wi project with, a with a more spontaneous character would be allowed to take place, like community gardening. Beside these efforts, the Senate has called in a mixed expert committee consisting of a group of younger architects, sociologists, a gender theorist, a city planner, geographer, curator and philosopher with expert knowledge on social economies, questions of climate change and management to formulate a particip participative project as a coming international building exhibition for 2020. Among them is also uh, the group Raumlabor. 
just uh, want to say a few words about IBA, uh, the International Building Exhibition. This is not just a form of exhibition. In Germany, it has rather functioned as a sort of institute and praxis for introducing new urban ideas and for anchoring them in German architectural culture. The IBA works both inside and outside conventional city planning protocols, providing it with an experimental field regarding spaces and generous time span. Spans and as such, it has been an important instrument for promoting new uh, as a novel directions in uh, urban design. So each EBA has reflected the questions of their time as well as design attitudes, aesthetics and political ideologies. Famous examples are the Hansa Viertel of uh, 1956, providing Berlin with a city in a park and residencies built by Oskar Niemeyer and Alva Aalto and other modern star architects. The, the gentle urban redevelopment movement, in contrast, promoted a social city that took into account small-scale structures and rewarded the maintenance work of the first squatter movement. It re renounced from repairing and all the leftover spaces, scars from the war that have long been claimed by their neighborhoods and turned into informal playgrounds and outdoor places by the people themselves. Instead of redeveloping them, these spots were rather recognized as important places and made official through the EBA. In this context, the prospect of an EBA, which centers centered on questions of community involvement, citizen participation, and democracy in spatial planning and design, would be a promising adventure, both politically as well as aesthetically. The question is now, how will EBA formulate its new task of managing the change from a focus on more representational and product-oriented forms of architecture and urban design examples towards a relational and process-oriented way of doing architecture? Can it give legacy to an open process? Can it handle uncertainties? Can it allow conflict? And this pr process will be very exciting to follow. So I jump over this and sum up. Um, the becoming of Tempelhofer Freiheit has emerged um, has engaged the fantasy of thousands of commentators and fueled countless individual proposals in various real and virtual forums and formats by now. At the same time, the promised collaborative planning process, as it has developed so far, has already received much criticism from various fractions. This does not necessarily point towards a failure. Conflict is part of all democratic processes and it bears the possibility of negotiations, links, coexistence and new alliances as well. Tempelhofer Freiheit will not stay as an empty space in the middle of the city. You see this proposal. Planned as an international garden show for 2017, the edges of the park will be developed for housing and several other functions will enter the park. But what it has created so far is a much frequented social interstice, a very large one with a temporary lifespan. However, its existence has already created a myth which demonstrates the need for free spaces in city centers that are not only driven by commercial interests, but where citizens can decide what activities should evolve. Thank you.